All right, welcome back everybody to another exciting session of CE 397, Control Theory for Smart Infrastructure. Last time we looked at underdetermined and overdetermined problems. Specifically, we looked at underdetermined and overdetermined problems for the set of linear equations of the form AX is equal to Y. And we discussed how there were three basic cases. Uh, one is the case where uh, A is square and full rank. And in that case, A is invertible, and we can find a unique solution to this problem. Um, but if that is not the case, there are two different types of problems that we looked at. There's the overdetermined problem, and then there's the underdetermined problem. So let's just quickly recap. For the overdetermined problem, uh, how do the number of equations relate to the number of unknowns? So first of all, for the overdetermined problem, uh, what shape is A? Tall, tall. So uh, how do the number of equations relate to the number of unknowns? So there's more equations than unknowns, okay? And does a solution exist to this set of equations? No. So no solution exists. We showed that we could find the, um, instead of finding an exact solution, we could instead minimize the error between AX and Y and produce our best estimate of the solution X through um, this expression here, which is the left pseudo inverse. So again, there's no solution to an overdetermined problem. Uh, the best we can get is by minimizing the error between AX and Y. And we can do that explicitly through this closed form expression, which is the left pseudo inverse of A. Okay. Uh, so for the underdetermined problem, what shape is our A matrix in that case? It's wide, right? So the number of equations is less than the number of unknowns. Okay. So it's underdetermined. And this means, oh, so is there, is there a solution to this set of equations? Yes. Is it unique? No. So there's actually infinitely many solutions. There's infinitely many solutions to problems of this form. Uh, so what we can do is we can find a best solution. And our interpretation of the best solution is it is the solution that is of minimum norm. So we're finding the minimum norm X that satisfies AX is equal to Y. Uh, and we can do that through this closed form expression here. This is the right pseudo inverse. Okay, so again, these are very important uh, concepts if you're going to be working with uh, data or just engineering problems in general, especially the left pseudo inverse comes up a lot in um, machine learning and data science type problems uh, where you're trying to fit a model to some large amount of data. Uh, we went through two examples of overdetermined and underdetermined problems. So we looked at the example of an overdetermined problem where we're trying to fit a line through a cluster of points, and we showed through the left pseudo inverse, we could uh, determine essentially the line of best fit. So uh, the left pseudo inverse is actually, it actually gives you the solution to the uh, linear regression problem, right? It gives you the least square solution to the linear regression problem. We found the line that minimizes the squared error uh, between the points and the line. Hey, similarly, for the underdetermined problem, we tried to fit a cubic polynomial to these two points. Uh, clearly, there are many such cubic polynomials that will go through both of these points. Uh, but using the right pseudo inverse, we were able to find the equation of the cubic polynomial such that the coefficients were of minimum norm in the two norm sense. Okay, so these are just two illustrative examples. I just want you to think of these conceptually when you're thinking of overdetermined and underdetermined problems. We'll come back to both of these concepts when we get into controllability and observability. So I told you that we were gonna cover it last time, but we didn't quite have enough time. And I'm just going to save it for our discussion on controllability and observability later. Um, but it turns out that the problem of finding the best control input to drive your system to some desired final state is uh, given by the underdetermined problem, whereas the problem of trying to infer the previous state of a system from some 
set of observations corresponds to the overdetermined problem. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on when we get to controllability and observability. Okay, so this stuff does have applications to control. Uh, I just want to make sure you have kind of the theoretical background before we get there. Okay, are there any questions on underdetermined and overdetermined systems of equations? Any questions on the pseudo inverses? No? Cool. Well, let's go ahead and get started with today's lesson then. So, today we're going to be talking about an extremely important topic. Uh, one of the most important topics for controls, but also something that's just generally uh, important for your uh, uh, engineering tool belt, let's say. We're going to be talking about the concept of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, so it's it's really difficult to overstate how important this concept is. Uh, we're going to be looking at eigenvectors and eigenvalues. We're going to look at the theory, and then we're going to do some applications to dynamical systems towards the end of class today. Okay, so who's familiar with the concept of eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Who's seen this concept before? Okay, so most of you have seen it. You've probably seen it in undergraduate differential equations, I'm guessing. Um, so what is kind of intuitively... Uh, What's the concept of an eigenvalue and eigenvector? Does anyone remember? Yeah, Jimmy? So the eigenvectors are the set of vectors such that if I have a matrix A acting on the eigenvector, it won't change the direction, but they can scale it. And the amount that they scaled by are called the eigenvalue. That's exactly correct. Yes. So uh, we'll get into the definition shortly. That's that's basically the exact definition of an eigenvalue and eigenvector. Uh, so we're going to be discussing the definition. We're going to also be just trying to gain some intuition to eigenvalues and eigenvectors and uh, what their purpose is uh, a little bit in this class. Um, but for the purposes of dynamical systems and controls, eigenvalues, eigenvectors is an important concept because it'll let us do a number of uh, important things. So first, uh, we're going to need it to um, compute functions of a matrix. So it'll allow us to compute arbitrary functions of a matrix, and in particular for uh, dealing with systems of ordinary differential equations, we'll need to compute the matrix exponential. So it turns out that you can compute arbitrary functions of a matrix. In this case, we are computing the exponential of a matrix, and you can do that um, in terms of the matrix's eigenvalues. And we'll show a little bit later how we can do that. Uh, kind of along the same lines, that will allow us to solve systems of ODEs. So it's important for kind of solving these dynamical systems. Uh, in homework five, you formulated these systems, but you haven't yet actually solved them. Uh, to do that, we will need to look at the eigen decomposition. Um, Third, it will allow us to kind of analyze some important intrinsic properties of systems of ODEs. In particular, it'll allow us to analyze stability, controllability, and observability. Okay, so we can do all of these things by just looking at the eigenvalues of our state space system. Uh, and it's also important because it allows us to kind of characterize what are the dominant modes of our systems of ODEs. So it sometimes turns out that there are, um, you can break down a system's response into its um, major frequencies. And it turns out there are some frequencies that are more important than others. So it allows us to, um, it allows us to characterize dominant modes and through looking at the most important frequencies we can actually uh, perform model reduction so we can create reduced order models um, especially if we have very large systems and we want to just 
kind of create an approximation of its basic behavior, we can use the eigen decomposition to determine the most important modes and create reduced order models from those modes. All right. So let's go ahead and discuss the formal definition of an eigenvalue eigenvector pair. And essentially the definition that Jimmy gave is the exact definition uh, that I'm going to give you here. So let's talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So if we have a non-zero vector, a non-zero vector V, which we're going to say is in CN, C November, uh, a non-zero vector V is a right eigenvector. of a matrix A in C n by n, November by November, if there exists a scalar lambda such that um, the following equation is true, A times V is equal to lambda V. Okay, so just as uh, Jimmy said before, uh, we define a vector V as a right eigenvector of A, if and only if, if you multiply A by V, it gives you back the same result as multiplying V by some scalar. And that scalar that it is uh, multiplied by, we call an eigenvalue. So this lambda here is an eigenvalue associated with that eigenvector V. Okay, similarly, we have that a non-zero vector, which we'll call U, and is also in CN, is a right eigenvector. associated with eigenvalue mu if uh, we have that u Hermitian transpose times a is equal to mu u Hermitian transpose. Okay, so note that there are both right eigenvectors and left eigenvectors. Uh, most of the time, we'll really only be dealing with the right eigenvectors. Actually, that's not completely true. Um, most of the time, when we're looking at eigenvectors, we will be computing the right eigenvectors, and there's a relationship between the right eigenvectors and left eigenvectors that we can use uh, to determine the left eigenvectors from the right eigenvectors. I'll show you uh, a little bit later how we can do that, but note that there are both uh, right eigenvectors and left eigenvectors. Was there a question? Uh, yes, sorry, that should be left. Sorry. Right. And it's uh, left because it's coming in from the left side here, uh, whereas the right eigenvector, it's on the right side of A. All right, so it's A times V, whereas the left eigenvector is U Hermitian transpose times A. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay, so let's just talk intuitively about what this means. Uh, so as we talked about at the beginning of class, let's say we have some vectors in a coordinate plane here. Let's say we have some vector X can just be any vector. Let's say we have an, eigenve uh, an eigenvector V1, and we might have some other eigenvector V2. Okay, so if we take just this arbitrary vector X and we apply a linear transformation A to it, um, the corresponding vector that it produces might land anywhere in this coordinate plane. So if we take X and multiply it by A, we may end up with a vector 
somewhere over here. Okay, what's special about eigenvectors is if we take these eigenvectors that are associated with our linear transformation A and we apply A to them, it will scale these eigenvectors by some amount. So this might be A times V1. It's going to be equivalent to taking our eigenvector V1 and multiplying it by the eigenvalue that corresponds to it, lambda 1. Okay, so if we take our eigenvector, we apply A to it, it's equivalent to scaling that vector by some scalar constant, lambda. Uh, and note that there is a unique, well, not necessarily unique, um, there is a eigenvalue that corresponds to each eigenvector. So this eigenvector v1 corresponds to eigenvalue v, uh, lambda 1. Okay. Similarly, we might have this other eigenvector v2. If we apply a to it, we might end up somewhere down here. Okay. So we have a v2 is equal to lambda 2 v2. Okay. So note that these scaling factors can also be signed. So it might be negative. Um, the vector that it lands on is still in the span of V2, but it might have an opposite sign, for instance. Okay, so in other words, the eigenvectors are the set of vectors that do not change direction when A is applied to them. Uh, and note that I should, I should be precise here, the eigenvectors of A, right? So these eigenvectors correspond to a given linear transformation A. Okay, great. Are there any conceptions, uh, sorry, any questions conceptually on uh, eigenvectors and their definition? Great. Uh, who's uh, who's seen who's seen this before? By the way, most of you here. Yeah, a couple of you. Okay. So um, again, a very important concept. Let's talk a little bit about how we can compute these. So you may have done this in undergraduate differential equations or undergraduate di uh, linear algebra. Let's talk about computing eigenvalues and eigenvectors all right so from our definition we have that an eigenvalue eigenvector pair for the linear transformation a is defined as follows so we have that a v is equal to lambda v okay so we can go ahead and take this expression here and just multiply V by the identity matrix. So we're gonna say A V is equal to lambda times the identity matrix times V, because we can simply just take any vector and multiply it by the identity matrix and we get back that vector. So let's go ahead and subtract lambda times I times V from both sides. So we'll have A V minus lambda I V is equal to zero. And now we can just factor out V here. So we have A minus lambda I V is equal to zero. Okay. Uh, equivalently, we could also write lambda I minus A times V is equal to zero. Did the same thing up to a factor of negative one. So we can just multiply through by negative one. Okay, so we have this expression here. What does this expression imply about V in relation to this matrix here, which I'll just call, uh, let's call this whole thing C. So what does this, what does this expression here imply about V, our eigenvector in relation to this matrix here, C? Sorry? Orthogonal? Well, um, C is a matrix. 
So we're taking a matrix and we're multiplying it by V and we're getting the zero vector. So how does that, uh, what does that imply about the relationship between V and C? Yes, V is in the null space of A minus lambda I. Okay, so we can write that V is in the null space of A minus lambda I or I minus lambda A, doesn't really matter. Okay, um, so we know that A minus lambda I has a null space, a non-trivial null space. So what does that imply about A minus lambda I? What does it imply about the rank of A minus lambda I? Right, so A minus lambda I is not full rank. That also means that it is not, what can't we do to it? We can't, it's not invertible. So we can write that a minus lambda i is not full rank. It's not invertible. And what do we, uh, we didn't really talk about it much in this class, but you might remember from undergraduate linear algebra, if a matrix is not invertible, what is its determinant? Does anyone remember? Right. So if, yeah, if the matrix is not invertible, its determinant is equal to zero. So we know that the determinant of A minus lambda I is equal to zero. Okay, so these two facts together give us a method for computing both the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of any matrix A. Okay, and specifically fact two is going to allow us to compute the eigenvalues. And fact one is going to allow us to compute the eigenvectors. And we'll see how in a second. Okay, so first, before I give you an example, let me give you a couple more definitions. It's going to be necessary to compute our eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So first, let's talk about the characteristic polynomial. And that sounds familiar. The characteristic polynomial of a matrix. So the characteristic polynomial, uh, let me get rid of this colon here, of a matrix A in C n by n is defined as follows. We call it pi of A is equal to the determinant of A minus lambda I. So this is the definition of the characteristic polynomial of a matrix A. Similarly, we can define a characteristic equation. For our same matrix A and to get the characteristic equation, um, much like we did before, all we have to do is set our characteristic polynomial to zero. So we have that zero is equal to the determinant of a minus lambda i, or equivalently, zero is equal to the determinant of lambda i minus a, because they're equal up to a factor of negative one. All right. So this is going to give us a method for computing the eigenvalues of our matrix A. Um, and just keep this terminology in mind, characteristic polynomial characteristic equation. It may relate to something we've seen uh, in class earlier. Okay, so let's go ahead and use this. Let's go ahead and use this formulation to compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for a example matrix. Okay, you may have done this in undergrad uh, or some of your other graduate classes. So let's have a matrix A, which we're going to define as being zero, one, negative two negative three. Okay, so the eigenvalues we know from fact two are given by the characteristic equation. So to find the eigenvalues, 
what we do is we take the determinant of A, uh, sorry, the determinant of lambda I minus A, and we set it equal to zero. So let's see what happens when we do that. Uh, we have that zero is equal to the determinant of lambda I minus A. So this will be the determinant, well, let me write this out a little bit more neatly, determinant of lambda zero zero lambda minus zero one negative two negative three. Okay, this will give us the determinant of the following matrix lambda negative one two lambda plus three right right and we can compute the determinant of a two by two matrix if you remember uh, we take the elements along the diagonal we multiply them by each other and then we subtract the product of the elements along the anti-diagonal okay, so this is our expression for the determinant of a two by two matrix so if we go ahead and compute that, we get lambda times lambda plus three minus negative one times two. Okay. And if we go ahead and uh, factor, or sorry, if we go ahead and expand this out, we get lambda squared plus three lambda plus two. All right, so how can we compute the eigenvalues? We know that this is equal to zero, right? So how do we how do we determine what the eigenvalues are? Yeah, we can just factor it. So let's go ahead and do that. We have uh, that zero is equal to lambda squared plus three lambda plus two. Uh, we can factor this into lambda plus one and lambda plus two, right? And therefore, our eigenvalues are equal to what? Negative one and negative two. Very good. Okay, so that's how we can compute the eigenvalues by hand for some matrix A. That's not too bad. So who's done this before? Who remembers doing this? So I think most of you have done this in undergrad. Um, Let's now take a look at how we can compute the eigenvectors for the same matrix. Let's look at the eigenvectors. Okay, so we know that for a given eigenvalue, lambda one, we have that uh, lambda one i minus a times v one is equal to zero, right? And we know lambda one. So in this case, lambda one was negative one. So how can we find the eigenvector v one using this knowledge? Does it correspond to anything we've done before in class? We have to find, uh, sorry, we have to find a vector V1 to satisfy this equation, right? Does it correspond to anything we've looked at before? Sorry? So we have to find a V1 such that V1 is in the null space of lambda one I minus A. So we can do this uh, using the same technique that we used for constructing a basis for the null space, right? So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and apply that same technique here. So we can just go ahead and substitute in uh, lambda one, and we have that lambda one is equal to negative one. So let's go ahead and see what comes out if we just compute uh, negative one i minus a. So we will get negative one, zero, zero, negative one, minus zero, one, negative two, negative three. This will give us 
uh, should be negative one, negative one, two, two. All right, so this is this is this expression here, negative one i minus a. What's the rank of this matrix? Can you tell just by looking at it? So it's one, right? There are uh, There is one linearly independent column. So what does the dimension of the null space have to be? Also one, from what piece of knowledge? <laughs> From the rank nullity theorem, we know that if the rank is one, the nullity has to also be one. So there is uh, our basis for the null space will consist of one vector. So there is one eigenvector associated with this eigenvalue. It's possible for uh, to have um, multiple eigenvectors associated with the same eigenvalue. So we have to check and check what the dimension of the null space is for each of these eigenvalues. All right. So as before, when we were computing the basis for the null space, we can make this a little simpler just by doing row reduction. So if we do row reduction, uh, we see that we can eliminate this second row just by taking two times the first row and adding it to the second row. And then we can multiply the first row by negative one and we will get one, one, zero, zero. Okay, so we know that that matrix one one zero zero times v one v two uh actually let's let's call this v one one v one two because this is only for the first eigenvector it has to be equal to zero the zero vector so what can we do now does anyone remember how do we compute uh we compute this vector here. <laughs> All right. So this is telling us that v11 plus v12 is equal to zero. Right. So our eigenvectors will have to be of the form v11 is equal to negative. V12. So we can create a candidate eigenvector. I'll just call it V1 tilde is equal to, uh, let's just call it one negative one. So this is, a, this is a valid eigenvector, but in general, we want our eigenvectors to be unit norm. So by convention. Uh, so what we can do is we can take this eigenvector, this candidate eigenvector, and divide it by its own norm. So what is the norm of this candidate eigenvector? The two norm? So the two norm will be the Euclidean norm, which will just be one squared plus negative one squared, right? So the norm will be root of two. So we can specify our eigenvector v1 as just being one divided by root two times one negative one. So this will give us a unit norm eigenvector that satisfies this equation. All right. So this is our first eigenvector. All right, now let's go ahead and go through the second eigenvector and uh, you're going to help me complete it. Okay, let's take a look at the second eigenvector. So what is our second eigenvalue? Negative two times I minus A times V2 has to equal the zero vector. All right, so let's take negative two, zero, zero, negative two minus A, zero, one, negative two, negative three. This will give us negative two, negative one, plus two, and uh, negative two plus three is one. All right, so what's the rank of this matrix? This is also one, right? Well, so that means that there is how many eigenvectors associated with this eigenvalue? Just one. 
OK, so let's go ahead and do reduced row echelon form. Uh, so we can just add the two rows together. The second one will go to 0. And then for the first one, we can just um, we can just multiply by negative one so that it's positive. I'll end up with two one. Okay, so we have that two one zero zero times our second eigenvector v two one v two two has to equal the zero vector. All right, and this implies that two times v two one is equal. Uh, sorry, plus v two two is equal to zero, which implies that uh, v21 is equal to negative one half v22. All right. So what is a candidate eigenvector for our second eigenvector? We could do, for instance, um, minus one, two. That'll work. Okay, what's the norm of this vector? So what is, a, what is the norm of this vector? All right, this will be square root of five, right? Because we have one squared plus two squared and take the square root. And therefore our second eigenvector is equal to one over root five of negative one, two. All right, so that is how you can compute the eigenvectors associated with a set of eigenvalues of A. Great, who's, uh, who's gone through that process before? Okay. A couple of you? Anyone else computed the eigenvectors to the matrix before? No? So yeah, often in undergraduate differential equations, they'll only teach eigenvalues, um, but eigenvectors are equally important. In some ways, they are more important. Uh, so it's important to understand how both of them are computed. All right. Are there any questions on the process of computing eigenvalues before I move on, or the process of computing eigenvectors? Mm -hmm. Right. So one quick note I want to make, um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors can only be computed for square matrices. So they are not defined for matrices that are non-square. If you want to compute an analogous set of values and vectors for non-square matrices, you will have to use what's called the singular value decomposition which I'll talk a little bit about next week. We're not gonna cover it in a huge amount of detail, but it's also an extremely important uh, concept that essentially extends the eigen decomposition to non-square matrices. All right. Cool. All right, let's move on. And let's talk a little bit about uh, another super important concept called diagonalization. So I'll give you a couple definitions here. So first let's talk about diagonalizability. Okay, so let's say we have a linear transformation. That we call A and it takes us from V to V. So some vector space V to uh, the same vector space V. So this would be uh, characteristic of a square matrix. Right? If you have a square matrix, it will take you, uh, the domain and the codomain will be the same. Okay, so if you have a linear transformation, um, A from V to V, it is diagonalizable if and only if the eigenvectors of A form a basis for V. So in other words, uh, let's say if, if A is in 
are n by n, this would imply that n linearly independent eigenvectors exist. Now, it's important to note that for square matrices, this is not always true. Um, there are some matrices that cannot be diagonalized. So in other, in other words, you can't find a set of, a complete set of linearly independent eigenvectors. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to this point a little bit later on. Um, essentially, when that happens, you'll have to use an alternative to the eigen decomposition called the Jordan canonical form. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but it's important to note because um, you have to make sure an, a matrix is actually diagonalizable if you are going to compute its eigen decomposition numerically. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later, but it's going to this concept is important for our next point. Um, let's talk about diagonalization. This is hugely important. Okay, so. Suppose that A in R n by n is diagonalizable. Okay. And let V be a matrix of right eigenvectors stacked together. So let's say that it's V is equal to uh, V1, V2, V3, all the way through Vn. And let U um, be a matrix of left eigenvectors stacked together. So we'll call this U is equal to U1, U2, all the way through UN. Then we can write A, we can decompose A into the following product. So we have that A is equal to V lambda U Hermitian transpose which is equal to V lambda V inverse. So any matrix that is diagonalizable, we can write as the following product. This is going to be hugely important later on. Uh, it'll allow us to do uh, a lot of really fun things. Um, so I just want you to kind of remember, remember this especially. Okay, uh, so let's go through why this is the case. Oh, sorry, uh, I need to write that out. So, um, so we have that V is the matrix of right eigenvectors. So V1, V2, all the way through Vn. We have that U Hermitian transpose. The rows are the left eigenvectors, so I'll write this as U1 Hermitian transpose, U2 Hermitian transpose, all the way through UN Hermitian transpose. And lambda is a diagonal matrix of the eigenvalues. Okay, so it'll be lambda one, lambda two, all the way through lambda n. And we can show this. Um, let me show this for you. We can show it without plugging in any numbers. Um, so let's just suppose that we have some matrix that we can define as each column is equal to A times each of the eigenvectors of A. So we have AV1, AV2, all the way through AVN. And by the definition of the eigenvalue eigenvector pair, we know that each of the columns has to be equal to lambda v1, lambda v2, sorry, this should be lambda 1 v1, lambda 2 v2, all the way through lambda n vn. Okay. 
So on the left side, we can actually just factor out this A. Um, we can factor out the A and we will end up with A times each of these columns here. Okay, who can, uh, who can kind of see why this is the case? Right, we have that each of these columns here, uh, if we multiply them by A, we get, you know, um, we get the first, uh, sorry, first row of A times the uh, first column, V1, and so on. So we can actually just factor out A from this matrix here and just put it on the left-hand side. Similarly, over here on the right, we can actually factor this out as well as a series of sums of outer products. So this will be V1, V2, all the way through Vn, multiplied by a set of lambdas along the diagonal. Okay, so you can see this if you just apply the definition of matrix multiplication of outer products. So this product will be, you know, V1 times lambda one, all zeros, plus V2 lambda two, uh, all the way up until Vn zero to lambda n, right? Okay, so you can separate out our product here into this product of two matrices. Okay. And if we take this, we recognize that this is the matrix of right eigenvectors. This here is the matrix of right eigenvectors. And this here is lambda. So we have that AV is equal to V lambda. And therefore, A is equal to V lambda V inverse. All right. Uh, similarly, we can we can do a similar thing for the left eigenvectors. So let's just assume, or let's suppose that U Hermitian transpose is equal to V inverse. We're just going to assume it, uh, and let's go ahead and plug that into our expression here. So we have that. Um, sorry, we have that. If we take this and we pre-multiply by V inverse and post-multiply by V, we have that V inverse A is equal to lambda V inverse. And therefore, under this assumption, we have that um, U Hermitian A is equal to lambda U Hermitian transpose. If we write this out, we will have our series of row vectors U1 Hermitian all the way through UN Hermitian times A is equal to a series of row vectors multiplied by our eigenvalues. So we'll have lambda one U1 Hermitian all the way through lambda N UN Hermitian. And note that this here is kind of the opposite of the case before. We have that this can be written as another sum of outer products. So this here is, we have lambda one as a column vector with zeros and all the other columns times U1 Hermitian plus and so on and so on all the way to the column vector with the final eigenvalue outer product with UN Hermitian, that's equivalent to this matrix here. So we can actually separate out this matrix as well. Uh, so now in this case, we have over on this side, we have U Hermitian A is equal to lambda on the left-hand side times U Hermitian using the definition of the matrix vector outer product. Therefore, A is equal to U Hermitian inverse times A times U Hermitian. 
Okay. And note that because we assumed that U Hermitian was the inverse of V, we now have that A is equal to V A U Hermitian. Sorry, V lambda U Hermitian. This should be a lambda here. So uh, to summarize, we have that any matrix A that is diagonalizable can be written as the product of these three matrices, um, V lambda U Hermitian, which is equal to V lambda V inverse. And there's also one other really important way that you can think about this that I actually uh, think is perhaps the best way to think about diagonalization. You can also think about this as the sum of scaled outer products of the eigenvectors of A. So you can think about A as being the sum from I equals one through N of lambda I, V I, U I Hermitian transpose. Or in other words, you have a series of outer products that are being summed together. Um, so you have, for instance, V1, U1 Hermitian transpose, scaled by lambda one plus lambda two times the outer product of V2, U2 Hermitian all the way through uh, lambda N. And I think I've run out of space here, but this will be VN times uh, UN Hermitian transpose. Gosh, I ran out of space there. Um, let me just write it down here. This is the outer product with U and Hermitian transpose. Okay, so you can think of when you diagonalize the matrix, um, you're essentially decomposing it into a set of scaling factors. So these are a set of scaling factors or magnitudes represented by the eigenvalues and a set of directions that are given by these outer products of the eigenvectors. So you're taking a series of directions and you're kind of arranging them and you're scaling them all and you're adding them together. And usually when we compute the eigen decomposition, we also order these eigenvalues such that they're in the order of their relative importance. So the larger the scaling factor, the more important that direction is in representing the dynamics of your system. All right. Cool. Any, any questions on diagonalization? Let me go back and quickly do an example of how we can diagonalize the system that we just looked at. Might like a little more clear. So from before we had that A was equal to zero, one, negative two, negative three, right? And we computed its eigenvectors as right eigenvectors. So this was V1, V2. And we have that the set of right eigenvectors, if we just stack those two eigenvectors together, we have one over root two, uh, negative one over root two, negative one over root five, and two divided by root five. Okay, and what I want to do is I want to write out the eigen decomposition of A as V, lambda v inverse okay so we have v we need to compute v inverse so how can we do that for a two by two matrix so if you remember um, from our linear algebra review the inverse of a two by two matrix we take one over the determinant of that matrix we switch these two diagonal elements and we multiply the anti-diagonal by negative one. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. First, we got to compute the determinant. Uh, so let me just write, we are finding V inverse. Let's compute the determinant of V. Okay, so this is going to be equal to one over root two times two over root five minus negative one over root five times negative one over root two. Okay. 
Uh, this will be two over root 10 minus uh, one over root 10, which will give us one over root 10. Okay, so our inverse of V will be equal to one over this quantity, which will just be root 10 times, we switch these two elements. So we get two over root five, uh, one over root two over on the other diagonal. And then these two here, we just multiply by negative one. So this will be one over root five. This will be one over root two. If we take this and we multiply through by root 10. Uh, what we will eventually get is two root two, root two, root five, root five. Okay, so we have the inverse. Let's go ahead and write out the full diagonalization. So we have that A is equal to V will be one over root two, negative one over root two, negative one over root five, and this will be two over root five. We take that, we multiply it by lambda. So what is our lambda gonna be? So it'll be a diagonal matrix, right? What will the elements on the diagonal be here? It's negative one, negative two. And the inverse we just computed should be two root two, root two, root five, root five. Okay, so in this case, A was diagonalizable. Uh, we can compute its diagonalization. So let me just write out A for good measure here. We have that zero, one, negative two, negative three is equal to this product here. And again, this is V lambda, V inverse, and A. Okay. Cool, so that's how you can diagonalize a matrix. We'll get a bit into applications of this process a bit later on. Are there any questions uh, on diagonalization before I move on? How much time do I have here? Okay, 15 minutes. Well, any questions on diagonalization before I move on? Who's, who's used diagonalization before? Has anyone used diagonalization in Python or MATLAB? No? So, one quick note I want to make, um, not all matrices are diagonalizable. And this is important, especially if you're trying to do diagonalization numerically. Uh, so for instance, the following matrix is not diagonalizable. This matrix cannot be decomposed uh, in the way that we showed in the previous slide. In fact, if you try to do this numerically in MATLAB, if you take, for instance, I A in MATLAB, MATLAB will actually lie to you. It will return the eigenvalues and eigenvectors corresponding to the following matrix instead. So it turns out that um, this matrix does not have a full set of linearly independent eigenvectors. Um, for matrices of this form, you have to use instead what's called the Jordan canonical form, which is the closest you can get to the true eigen decomposition. There is no eigen decomposition or there's no diagonalization of this, this particular matrix. Um, and it's important to know that because Again, if you try to do this numerically, it will give you the wrong answer. Uh, and there is unfortunately no stable numerical method for computing the Jordan form of a matrix. So you kind of have to know beforehand if your matrix is diagonalizable or not. So not all matrices are diagonalizable. Not all square matrices are diagonalizable. But is there a way to tell if it is diagonalizable if we can't know already what the eigenvectors are? Uh, I think the primary way to test that is to try to diagonalize it and see if it uh, diagonalizes, unfortunately. There's not really a good way of uh, diagnosing whether it's diagonalizable or not without trying it. Uh, and unfortunately, the only way to compute the Jordan form 
is to do it symbolically. So there are symbolic toolboxes in MATLAB or Python to do it. Um, but I just want to give you this caveat. Uh, don't necessarily uh, trust your computer and what it's telling. Okay. All right. Well, so before I finish today, um, I want to bring this back to dynamical systems, which we haven't seen in a while. Uh, and I want to connect some of these new concepts from linear algebra with what we talked about in the first part of the course. Okay, so specifically, I want to make a connection uh, between the eigenvalues and the properties of our dynamical systems. So let's talk about eigenvalues in dynamical systems. Okay, so consider the homogeneous LTI system. Let's say we have x dot of t is equal to a times x of t. Okay, the eigenvalues of a play a special role in the properties of this system. And you're going to see in a second what that role is. So I know that there are some questions about uh, the relationship between the state space form and the frequency domain. We're going to get into it uh, in this next example here. So let's go back to our old friend, the structural system. Okay, we have our structural system. We have some force F of T, stiffness K damping C, mass M induces a displacement X of T. Uh, and actually, let's just consider the homogeneous case right now. So let's just forget about this force here. Okay, so we know that the dynamics of the system are given by X double dot plus CX dot plus KX is equal to zero, right? And we remember that the characteristic equation of the system in the frequency domain is given by S squared plus C over M times S plus K over M is equal to zero. So just put that in the back of your mind for now. That's the characteristic equation of the system. Um, remember that from the characteristic equation, we can get the what of the system to characterize its uh, dynamics. The pulse, right? We can get the pulse from the characteristic equation. All right, so let's go ahead and write out the state space form for this system. We have that x dot, x double dot is equal to zero, one negative k over m, negative c over m times the vector, state vector x, x dot. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to see what happens when we compute the eigenvalues of this system. So we, to, how do we compute the eigenvalues again? What was our equation for computing the eigenvalues? Yeah, so it was the determinant of lambda i minus a is equal to zero. Uh, just for fun, let's instead of using the variable lambda, let's use s. Doesn't really matter what it's called. Okay, so if we take s zero zero s minus zero one negative k over m, negative c over m, to take the determinant, we end up with determinant of s negative one, k over m, and then we have s plus c over m. Okay, this is equal to zero. Let's go ahead and compute this determinant. What is this first row, this first row will be S times S plus C over M. 
minus negative one times k over m is equal to zero. And if we move to the next page here and expand this out, what we'll get is that zero is equal to s squared plus c over m times s plus k over m. <laughs> so this is the big reveal. Um, what does this imply about the relationship between the poles and the eigenvalues? They're the same thing. Okay. So in other words, the eigen decomposition is kind of like the, uh, it's kind of like looking at your system in the frequency domain, okay? If you have a state space system in the time domain and you take its eigen decomposition, that's kind of equivalent to taking the uh, frequency domain uh, representation of the system. Uh, in other words, let me just summarize here. The eigenvalues, are the poles. Eigenvalues are the poles of our dynamical system. All right, and let's go ahead and just put in some numbers just to make it more concrete. So let's set, uh, let's let m equals one, k equals two, c equals three. All right, and we will have our system of the form x dot, x double dot is equal to, zero, one, negative two, negative three, x, x dot. Okay, we know that the characteristic equation is zero is equal to s squared plus c over m s plus k over m, which will be s squared plus three s plus two. If we factor this out, it's the same as before. We will get s plus one, s plus two, and therefore our poles are at negative one and negative two. Great. Okay, so I've got about five minutes left. Hmm. I don't think I have enough time to go through modal coordinates. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an expression for how you can convert between state space form and the transfer function of a system. Okay, so this is something that um, I'm actually only gonna show you how to go one way. There is a way to go the other way, but let's go from um, computing the transfer function from the state space form. Okay, so let's say we have our full state space system, x dot of t is equal to ax of t plus b u of t. And let's say we also have our observation equation y of t is equal to cx of t plus d u of t. And we know that the Laplace transform is a linear operator. So we can actually just take the Laplace transform of both of these. And even though it's a vector, we can still treat it the same way. So if we take the Laplace transform of the top equation, we end up with S times X of S minus X zero. Um, actually to denote that this is in the frequency domain, I'll put a little hat over it. This is in the time domain here. Okay, this is equal to a times x of s plus b times u of s. I'll call this u hat as well. Uh, similarly, we have that y hat of s is equal to c x hat of s plus d u hat of s. Okay, so for the transfer function, we don't really care about the initial conditions. So let's just forget about them. We're only interested in the input output relationship. 
So we have that S times X of S is equal to AXS plus BU of S. Um, let's go ahead and move this A times X of S over to the other side. So we have that S times X of S minus A times X of S is equal to uh, B times U hat of S. And we can factor this out. Um, so this just becomes SI minus A times X hat of S is equal to B times U of S. Okay. And so now if we want to get the expression for X of S in the frequency domain, what can we do? We want to isolate X of S on the right hand, on the left hand side. We can take the inverse of this expression, right? So we have X hat of S is equal to SI minus A inverse times B U hat of S. So this, uh, we're almost all the way there to our transfer function. Remember that we also have that Y hat of S is equal to C times X hat of S plus D U hat of S. So all we need to do is plug in this expression for X hat of S here. And what we end up with is the expression for our transfer function, Y hat of S is equal to C times SI minus A inverse times B U hat of S. Uh, sorry, let me actually factor out this U hat of S. So we have C times SI minus A inverse times B plus D all times U hat of S. So this equation here will give you the transfer function of any state space system. So this is the equation that uh, you can use to convert from state space form to transfer function. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. So let me just write, this is the transfer function for state space system. All right, so I'm officially out of time. Um, just remember again, homework five is due tonight. I will post homework six soon, and I'm also gonna post some instructions for the project uh, for you to start thinking about that as well. Okay, uh, with that, have a great weekend and uh, we'll see you next week.